the National Broadcasting Company presents The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Sam Spade, Detective Agency. Me, sweetheart. Was it awful, Sam? Excruciating. If I suffered, girl, how I suffered. But there's no other way, Sam. Hmm? When fate turns against a man... True, dear one, true, but from somewhere I must find strength. You must. You must. To pick up the shattered fragments of my life, to raise my eyes once again to the horizon and piece by piece put them together again. Oh, and the two of us, dear one, hand in hand, shall go marching down the years together. Oh, yes. Brace yourself, sweetheart. I'll try, Sam. Gather together the homely, humble tools of your trade, find six dry handkerchiefs, and prepare to greet me with a smile behind the tears. I'll be down before you can change stations with a report entitled The Soap Opera Caper. For NBC, William Spear, radio's outstanding producer, director of mystery and crime drama, brings you the greatest private detective of them all in The Adventures of Sam Spade. Sam? Who called, young widow Perrine? Plain F. Is it all over, Sam? Is a soap opera ever over, dear one? out on the phone like you... I know, I know, but it's not the end. It's never the end. Pull up a chair now. Take a firm grip on pad, pencil, and your emotions. Got them? I'm with the ready, Sam. Good show. <laughs> to Agatha Pilbeam from Samuel Spade, license number 137596. Subject, the soap opera caper. How was I to know what was on her mind? This strange woman, this mysterious Agatha Pilbeam, this voice on the telephone, directing me to the big, sprawling house in Hillsborough. Is that clear, Mr. Spade? How urgent is it, Miss Pilbeam? Very, very urgent, Mr. Spade. I, I don't know which way to turn. So I went to the big, sprawling house in Hillsboro, pulled up behind an ancient Model A parked at the curb, and was walking past it toward the gate when... Spade. Huh? Oh. Oh. Crock Morton, isn't it? <laughs> Good old Sammy. You remember. Yeah, yeah. When'd you get out? I, I, oh, last month. But mm -hmm. I'm a good boy now. Here, take one of my cards. Yeah, if you know anyone who needs a first-class private eye, Crock's available. Uh, what are you doing here, Sam? The lady wants to see me. The soap opera queen? Is that what she is? Sure, six or eight of them she writes. Oh? Uh, behind the clouds, mm -hmm. the heart of Julia Jukes. Uh, life, uh, oh, I forget the rest. Yeah. Beats gum shooting, Sammy. Yeah, well, right if you get work, Croc. <laughs> I'm on a job right now. You mean you got your license already? Oh, me? Well, I... Well, you can always run off a photo status of someone else's. Oh, oh Sam, that's mean. <laughs> Crock was a crook, but a nice crook. He never killed anybody. He was just an uncurable camera fiend, specializing in taking pictures of people doing what they hadn't ought to be doing, you know, stuff like that. Or if you wanted a photostat of somebody else's document, Crock was your man. Well, I walked up the drive to the door, threw it past a white shirt front that turned out to have a butler in it, and toward what seemed to be your study. But it wasn't. It was your bedroom, and you were reclining on six pillows with a cigarette in a long holder in one hand and a mouthpiece of a dictating machine in the other. But, John, hush, Melinda, there is no way to go now but ahead. John, you're so strong. I need you. I need your courage. We must face this thing together, Melinda. The organ what was Veronica a phonograph says, playing in her ear. There is indeed. I waited for an opening, but there like... just wasn't any, so, so I had to interrupt. John, don't even uh, Miss uh, don't you Pilbeam, see, Melinda, we uh, can't run uh, away from life. Uh, uh, miss we must approach this Miss Pilbeam? Thing calmly, uh, Melinda. No, uh, uh, <laughs> beg your pardon. Oh, uh, just a minute. Oh. My mood music. I see. Uh, I'm Sam Spade, Miss Pilbeam. You come. Come uh, sit beside me, Mr. Spade. Well. It's time we talk things over. Well, thanks. Oh, maybe you'd better start at the... When a woman reaches 40, Mr. Spade, she comes to lean upon her man. Oh? To look upon him not just as someone to cherish... But as a source, a spring, a fountain of strength. Mm -hmm. Are you still dictating? 
I'm talking about me, Mr. Spade. Oh. Whom can I turn to? Whom? I grope, I flounder in the darkness, I cry out, I listen in vain for an answer. But there is none. Well, you always have a better chance of getting an answer when you ask a question. What do you mean? What are we talking about? What indeed? Well, I haven't caught the show lately. You'll uh, have to bring me up to date. Why don't you run through the announcer's part, will you? You know, right after the organ when he says, uh, when we left Julia Jukes yesterday... I'm sorry, I thought I told you on the telephone. No. For many days now, I've seen somewhat of a strange new look on my husband's face. Husband? Dr. Martin Hawk. Oh, you're married. I thought it was Miss Agatha Philby. Well, two years ago today, I met young Dr. Hawkes and married him. Yeah. Life became beautiful, a gay laughing thing, a road to happiness. And then... Then? A cloud passed over the sun. Martin became moody, silent. I tried to penetrate the shell, but he only drew farther into it. The strange, terrifying crevasse seemed to have opened up between us. Well. What is it, Martin? I asked him repeatedly. But he'd only stare silently out the window. And finally walked silently from the room. Well, uh, how long did this go on? How, how long a series did you get out of it? For a week until a few days ago when the final blow fell. Mm. It was evening, and Agatha and Martin were at dinner. Let's look in on them as... Oh, sorry. Mm. Uh, we were at dinner when the doorbell rang, and I answered it. It was a telegram from mm. Martin. From Mexico. I gave it to him and watched the blood drain from his handsome features as he read it. His hand trembled, his jaw clenched. But you forced yourself to speak. Yes. Yeah. What is it, Martin, I asked. Tell me, please, for the sake of our love. And he... Looked down at me as if I were a stranger. Yeah. And then he crumpled the telegram, threw it savagely into the fireplace, and strode silently from the room. Here. Here, I rested it from the flames. Read it. Thank you. Uh, regret must confirm your worst fears, Cardoza. What is the terrible secret of Martin Hawk? Yes. Why did he act so strangely when the mysterious telegram arrived from Mexico? And above all, where is he? You mean he didn't come back? He's been gone for four days, Mr. Spade. I must find him. Now, of all times, I need his love. Yes. When a woman reaches for him... I know, I know. What do you mean, now, of all times? In just a week now... Since the report came back from the laboratory after my physical examination. Oh. The doctor from Vienna. Mm -hmm. You see, Mr. Spade, I, too, have a terrible secret. Well, uh, don't you want to tell me about it? Yes. Oh. I have a very rare, incurable disease. There are only, only six short weeks to live. Less than an hour after his distressing interview with Agatha, our boy Sammy walked into the beautifully appointed office of young Dr. Hawks at 450 Sutter to find his nurse, pretty young Nora Sheldrake, a new character, working at her desk in the reception room. In response to a question from Sammy, we hear Nora saying, I have no idea where Martin has gone, Mr. Spade, but I can tell you why. Tell me, Nora. Please feel free to tell me everything. It's that... that woman, Mr. Spade. Agatha? Yes. Yes, Agatha. Mm -hmm. She never understood Martin. She doesn't understand Martin. She never has tried to understand Martin. Do you hear me? Yes, she uh, never has tried. I, I take it you don't care for Agatha Pilgrim. I hate her. Nora. I do. I hate her. She thinks her money can buy everything, even Martin. Well, it won't. She knows that now. Well, calm yourself, Nora. Try and think back now to the last time you saw Martin Hawks. It... It was Monday. Four days ago? Yes. The call came from some legal firm named Bennett and Hatch. Now, let me write that down. I switched the call into Martin. I was worried for him. I was concerned. I have to admit now I did a terrible thing. Ah. You listened in. I did. They told him his sister was in town, that she was working at some... at some nightclub. and wanted to see him. Uh, what nightclub was this? Let me see. It was the... the Tortuga. Mm -hmm. 
What else? That's all. They hung up then, and Martin came out. I watched the blood drain from his handsome features. His hand trembled, his jaw clenched. Yes. I'm going out, Nora, he said. If I'm not back, don't worry. That's all. It was so light, Martin. The Tortuga was only a few blocks away on Post Street, so I walked there. We were just tooling up for the dinner trade when I arrived. I sailed around backstage like Billy Rose on an inspection tour. Found the doorman and showed him the snapshot you'd given me of young Dr. Hawks. Or tried to. Look, young fella, I told you we don't have no dancer here named Hawks. I ain't got no, time to... Doorman, do doorman, please, uh, uh, take a look at the picture. No, I ain't got to... Picture. Picture. Yeah. 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 Hmm? That fella was here. Perfect. Tuesday, uh, there. Uh, Monday night it was. Well, who'd he come to see? There uh, wasn't nobody named Hawks, mister. It was Beth Chardine. Well, bless you, Dorman. Bless you. Uh, bless you, too. Thank you. <laughs> Beth Jardine. Huh? Come in. Uh, I, uh... Close the door, oh. will you? Yeah. Rafty. Yeah, yeah. Is, uh, is there anything I can... There sure is. Sit me up, Jack. I'm Sam. I don't care if you'll bore us call off. You got hands, haven't you? Well, Sit me up. Uh, okay. You say when. <laughs> when? Can you breathe? Oh, no. You can't have everything. <sighs> Ouch. <sighs> What's on your mind, Jack? Martin Hawks. Sorry. Never heard of him. Look, we're getting along beautifully up to now, honey. Let's not spoil it. You not only know Martin Hawks, you're his sister. What makes you think What's I that know? card stuck over there in the mirror? Bennett and Hatch, attorneys at law. Aha! Uh -huh. The same Bennett and or Hatch who called Martin Monday afternoon and told him his sister wanted to see him here. Now, what's this all about? Uh, I can't tell you. He got a telegram from Mexico. Mexico? Yeah, it upset him something awful. What did it say? Regret must confirm your worst fear. You're dead, huh? Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> great. <laughs> Pretty hilarious, huh? Jackie just ain't got no idea. I got a piece of advice for you, Jack. Oh? Forget about Marty Hawks and live a long and useful life. Mm hmm I got a tip for you, too. You're in a tight spot. Watch that zipper, Jack. <laughs> One of the heavier soap opera types Beth was, with a throaty voice and the talent for the smirching reputation. What was the mysterious influence she wielded over young Dr. Hawks? How much did she know about his strange disappearance? What about the cryptic telegram from Mexico City? And what about dinner? The last question I could answer. I stopped at Schroeder's for Sarbrodden and potato pancakes, ran into Larry Mahoney of Homicide, who was off duty, and we stopped in at a handy alley and bowled until 11. I was walking back down Market Street when I passed the flood building, which reminded me of the firm of Bennett and Hatch, who resided there. As a matter of fact, it looked like they were there right now, since the light was on behind the second floor window with their name on it. Now, the sensible thing would have been to call around nine in the morning, but as I seldom do sensible things, I hustled up the stairs and down the corridor to their office. Someone other than Bennett or Hatch had put in some time, obviously. The drawers of a dozen or more file cases had been pulled out and dumped on the floor. The desk drawers, likewise. And to mark it clearly as the work of a thoroughgoing professional, the safe door was off its hinges. All this took me back to the Model A parked in front of your house this afternoon, Agatha, and I was contemplating same when... Oh. Hello? Bennett. Yeah? Good sister, I was scared you wouldn't be there. Try to get you home. Do it, baby, do it. Pull the string. We'll never make it with this guy. We'll throw, pull the string here. Do it, baby, do it. Make it. Hello? Operator. Operator. Operator! I finally got someone at the Tortuga Club who knew where Beth Jardine lived, an apartment on Russian Hill. I didn't stop to ask which apartment, and when I got there, I found I didn't have to. All right, stand back, everybody! Stand back. Dugan. Uh, oh, hello, Sam. What happened? Sam just knocked herself off. Huh? Jumped from a room on the eighth floor. 
Stand back, you yowls! There was no need to, but I looked at her anyway, just to make sure. It was Beth, all right. When she said she was through, she meant it. I was just turning to go, and something big in a tan camel's hair brushed past me and bent over the body. Where is she? Where? Beth! Sister! Beth! Beth! <laughs> I recognized him from the snapshot. Wild-haired, with a four-day's growth of beard on his lean, handsome face. It was Martin Hawks on the verge of collapse. Officer Dugan and I helped him through the crowd toward the ambulance that had just rolled up, sat him on the running board, and began to question him. Oh, what? Well, that again? Your name, your name, what's your name? What? My name? Of course, I... I... My name, I... I, I don't know. I don't know my name. It happens to everyone in soap operas, sooner or later. When he filled out the forms on poor Beth Jardine, old Doc Peterson gave Martin a double O, blew his nose, mm -hmm. and announced with a twinkle in his eye, Here's to me like young Dr. Hawks has got himself a case of amnesia. Will the mind of young Dr. Hawks come out of the fog? What does he know about the death of Beth? Was it murder or suicide or both? And what of the mysterious telegram from Mexico City? Will Agatha ever discover the terrible secret of young Dr. Hawks? And will stupid Sam ever discover anything? Before we continue, a word from our announcer. You are listening to the weekly adventure of radio's most famous detective, Sam Spade. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Saturday night is date night, but tomorrow poor Dennis Day has trouble with his girlfriend Gloria. However, Dennis manages to sing his way out of trouble in his charming, boyish fashion. And say, why not let Dennis help your Saturday evening along, too? And for more music and fun tomorrow, there's the Judy Canova Show, starring Judy in a melodic and carefree half hour of laughs. And Grand Ole Opry with singing MC Red Foley and his special guest, cowboy troubadour Ernie Tubb. Now back to the soap opera caper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. It's a half hour later now in the sterile whiteness of a hospital room that the three of us, you, Agatha, I, and old Doc Peterson, gather around the pale, quiet form of young Dr. Hawks. Martin. Martin, speak to me. Huh? Oh, I'm... Martin, darling. Uh, who, who are you? Agatha, dear. Your own Agatha. Uh, 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 Come, Agatha. Let her leave him be for now. Like I, I can't go on when a woman reads. I know, I know. You got to be strong, Agatha. Sam, mm -hmm. we better leave him be for now. Well, you're the doctor. Oh, Doc, what could have done this to Martin? Oh, shock sometimes. You don't mean... Yes, I'm afraid I do. Seeing his sister, then? Could be. Or sometimes it's just a matter of a body getting into such a fix his mind backs off and refuses to have any part of it. The wire from Mexico City. Huh? Eh? His terrible secret. The strange threat hanging over him and his sister. Driving one to suicide, and the other, the other, did he? Well? No wonder poor Martin gave away before this. Sure, sure, and there's still another explanation. How's that, Sam? That he figured amnesia was a nice, easy way not to have to account for what he's been up to for the last four days, or where he was when the dame took off from the eighth story. Mr. Spade, you're not accusing Martin. There's something of... buzzing around in his little mind. The nurse tells me she got him into a pair of pajamas and tucked him in nice and cozy before we got here. Well? Yes. Well? You may not have noticed, Agatha, 
because he'd pulled the covers up around his neck. But our boy had his clothes back on just now. What? Martin! Hey! He's gone! Indeed he was, was Martin, as we could plainly deduce from the open window and the curtains blowing gently out over the fire escape. Young Dr. Hawks, indeed, had packed up his amnesia, his terrible secret, and his toothbrush, and taken off into the night. So I left you sobbing gently on old Doc's shoulder and found me a phone in a drugstore a safe distance away. On the 48th ring, Bennett of Bennett and Hatch attorneys answered. He was sleepy. I used all my soft answers, and he used all his hard ones, and finally we got to the point. All right, Spade, all right. The Jardine dame left a sealed envelope with us. What was in it? How do I know? It was sealed, marked personal and confidential, to be delivered to the city attorney in the event of my death. Signed, Beth Jardine Hawk. Signed how? Beth Jardine Hawk. Not Beth Hawks Jardine. No. Is it important? Just a tiresome detail, Bennett. So she brought you the envelope, paid your fee, and you stuck it in the vault for her. Then what? Well, she had us call her brother and tell him to meet her at the Tortuga. Period. That ended our part of it. We didn't even get our feet wet. On the contrary, Bennett, you're up to your ears. In what? Blackmail. Bye. Which explained many things. To wit, A, the wire from Mexico City from a lawyer named Cardoza. B, the murder of Beth Jardine. And C, the reason for young Dr. Hawk's mysterious flight from the hospital. His mind still fogged with amnesia. It did not, however, explain why stupid Sam had kept Croc Morton's business card in his vest pocket for 21 pages without doing something about it. The address was near 3rd and Howard, not one of the better business sections, even for a private detective. I walked down 3rd Street past the Sherry and Muscatel joints, looking at numbers, and then discovered it wasn't necessary. The old Model A was pulled up in front of white, what might have been a respectable office building before the earthquake, but now couldn't decide whether to be a warehouse or a tenement. Thus far, a harmonious picture. But behind the Model A was something twice as long and three times as shiny with a motor running. Out of place by about $4,000. Out kind of late, aren't you, Nora? <gasps> Sam! Nora. Sam! Nora. Uh, 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 uh. Don't reach for the horn. But he told me... Sure, and you believed it. Like everything else he told you. Come on, get out. I will not get out. Oh, but you will. I'll pull you out by your pretty blonde hair. Now, come on. You, you, oh. ah, that's it. You can't do this to me, Mr. Spade. Nothing can stop Martin and me. We have our right to happiness. Uh-huh. Just the two of you. Chins up, eyes on the horizon. Let the dead past bury its dead. How can you joke it's about... It's no joke, believe me. You got taxi fare? Why? Because you're going to get in my cab, go home, put your hair up in curlers, and go to bed. After saying to yourself 1,000 times, what a lucky little girl you are that Martin Hawks didn't shove you out a window, too. Now, scoot. Scoot! It was a kind of a dark stairway that made me yearn for the comfortable feel of a shoulder holster under my left arm. At the top was a three-and-a-half-watt bulb, and at the other end of the hallway, a crack of light under Croc's office door. Between the two was a cat, more's the pity. So abandoning my stealthy approach, I walked up to the door, turned the knob, stuck my hand in my side coat pocket like Edward G. Robinson, and kicked the door open. Croc was sitting at his desk behind a stack of bills. The closet door was just closing softly. Who was in the closet? And did he still have his toothbrush, his terrible secret, and his amnesia with him? Well, Sammy, yeah. you, uh, you took me up on it right quick, huh? Uh-huh. Yeah, have a chair. I sat on a chair in the corner out of line of the closet door behind the desk. Oh, oh Sammy, mm -hmm. you got a job for me, huh? Yeah, yeah, you, uh, you don't look like you need a job, Crock. Huh? Oh, this? Yeah. Oh, this is nothing. Good day at the track, that's all. What's on your mind? Remember the Blennerhassett job? Huh? The one with the letters before you went up? What are you talking about, sir? The shakedown, Croc. The dame who wanted you to get the letters back, remember? You know, so you got them for her, delivered and collected after you had the photostats made. Sam, you're, you're crazy. Oh. I never done no such thing. You can level with me, Croc. You collected on the photostats for eight years. Oh, wait, Sam. Wait. Well, forget it. Anyway, I got another one. Dr. Martin Hawks. Married to the soap opera queen, you know. Well, what about it, Sam? She's worth a couple of million bucks and has six weeks to live. As her husband, he's her only heir. I spot the being. 
Yes. Only he isn't her husband. Huh? Because the Mexican divorce from his first wife, the late Beth Jardine Hawks, wasn't legal, you know. What? She blew in a month ago and began shaking him down after leaving the marriage certificate and a batch of other papers with some lawyers for life insurance. Sam, I, I just ain't interested. When you hear the payoff, Croc, it's just like the dame with letters. Oh. What do you mean? Hawks hired someone to crack the lawyer's office and get the papers out of the safe. Some smart guy. Uh, an unfrocked private eye who doesn't have a license. Uh, I found out where he had the photostats made, though. I can get copies. Hey, for crying out loud, shut up. The closet doorknob was turning slowly. I waved him out of the way and picked up the chair. It was all over two seconds after it started. The door flew open. He came out with a terrible secret, which turned out to be a gun. And I wrapped the chair right around his head. So I picked up the gun and Croc and young Dr. Hawks, and we all picked up a ride to headquarters. Only one scene remained to be played in today's exciting episode. Oh, I should try to be brave, Mr. Spade. It sounds like such a cliche now. Uh, good show, Agatha. Good show. Life must go on, you know. Even when a woman... You were born in 1911, I believe. Uh, yes, yes. As I say, life must go on, even when a woman... Reaches... Indeed it must. Indeed it must. We have our happy moments and our sad ones, our pleasures, our trials, our joys, and our heartbreaks. And sometimes, Mr. Spade... Yes? Sometimes at the bottom of our cup of bitterness, we find a pearl. We do? The laboratory, A mistake, definitely. They got yours mixed up with someone else's, and you have no incurable disease and many years of happiness ahead of you. Yes, Mr. Spade. But happiness? I wonder. Can a woman pass forty whose husband is a convicted murderer find happiness? Alone? Uh, well, uh, good show. <laughs> Period, end of opera. Oh, Sam. Uh-huh. Sam, I can't wait for tomorrow's episode. I'll be sure to tune in at this very same time, Cherub, and meanwhile, answer me this. What, Sam? How long will it take a woman past 20 to turn out a 25-page report? <laughs> yes, sir. I'll have the answer after a brief word from our announcer. <laughs> Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Tomorrow, Arturo Toscanini will conduct the renowned NBC Symphony in the fourth of a Saturday concert series. For tomorrow's one-hour performance, celebrated maestro Toscanini has chosen works by Debussy, Respighi, and Edward Elgar. You're invited tomorrow to the NBC Symphony and Toscanini. Tears now, no tears. They're tears of gratitude, Sam. Mm. When I read all this about other people's troubles, I'm, I'm so grateful to you for the smooth life we have together. Effie. Sam. Effie. Sam. Effie. Sam. That takes about ten seconds. Go ahead. I'm only merely a secretary, but... <sighs> over now. Matter of fact, we're ten seconds over. Oh, well, Sam, I, I haven't even your wife to be versus... Nothing but peace and quiet. And fairly regular paycheck. With only a corpse now and then to produce a ripple on the mirror smoothness of our bliss. Oh, that's beautiful, Sam. I thought so. You don't have a, a single terrible secret either. No, but just to keep you interested, dear one, from time to time I shall pick up a piece of paper, read it, let the blood drain slowly from my face, then clasp you to me thusly. Sam. Holding you close and just before striding silently from the room, mutter in your shell pink ear. I know. Good night, sweetheart. The Adventures of Sam Spade are produced, edited, and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade was played by Stephen Dunn. Lorene Tuttle is Effie. Script for tonight's adventure by Harold Swanton. Musical scoring by Lud Gluskin, conducted by Robert Armbruster. Join us again next week, same time, for another adventure with Sam Spade. Join the magnificent Montague and have fun at Duffy's Tavern on NBC.